Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to show you how to implement authentication in your Fast API apps. And the type of authentication I'll be using is OAuth2 with JSON Web Token. So this is what people have been requesting. So I figured I'd cover this particular method of authentication. There are other methods of authentication, but uh, this is the one that people have been asking for. And it's a pretty standard one when it comes to a lot of APIs as well. So I have my virtual environment here, and the first thing I'll do is install Fast API. A fast API, and I'll also install Hypercorn as the server to run my app. So everything should be installed. And I'm going to create two examples to demonstrate this authentication. So the first example will be really simple and it's going to demonstrate the flow. And then the second example is going to actually authenticate someone and you know you can get their information, everything. I'll use a, a database and tortoise ORM and just make it more realistic, but I think I should show you the flow first without all the extra stuff around it and then show you how everything works in a realistic example. So what I'll do first is I'll create a file called example. So touch example.py. And in this example, first thing I need to do is I uh, import from fast API, a so fast API, and then I'll instantiate fast API just like that. And just to make sure everything is working, I'll start a Hypercorn example app, and then I'll just set the reload flag. I'll go over to my browser, and then it's going to be uh, 127001 port 8000. And we see I get not found because I have nothing on the index, but if I go to the docs, uh, we see no operations defined, but I do have the fast API docs here. So that part works so far. So uh, what I wanna do for this flow is basically three things. So first I'm going to create the OAuth2 schema and this schema is going to allow me to use this easily in Fast API. So really it makes sense to show you if I, when I use this scheme. But uh, once I create the OAuth2 scheme and specify a URL for uh, generating a token, we'll see on the front end here in the documentation what changes. Right? And then uh, I'll also create a simple uh, endpoint that will just return some data. And this data is just going to mirror back the token. So the first thing I want to do is I want to import from fast API security. So from fast API dot security, I'm going to import the OAuth2 password bear. So this comes included with fast API, which makes authentication really easy. And we see it has OAuth2 in the name. So you can probably guess there are other types of authentication you can do in Fast API, but OAuth2 is what I'll be starting with here. And what I want to do is I want to instantiate that. So I'll just call this OAuth2 scheme. And I'll instantiate this OAuth2 password bear. And what I need to pass to this is a token URL. So token URL. And this is going to be some endpoint that generates a token for us. So we have to create the endpoint that generates the token, but Fast API will handle actually calling this endpoint, which I'll show you in a moment. I'm going to call this token. And then from there, what I can do is I can create an endpoint app post and slash token. So this is going to be called at some point to generate our token and our token is going to represent uh, who is logged in, right? So I'll make this a function and I'll call this token. And this route or this endpoint token is going to take in a couple of things at a minimum. It's going to take in a username and a password. So the idea is you pass a username and a password to this token endpoint, and it's going to generate a token somehow. And like I said, we're responsible for generating that token. So I could create a username and password thing myself in terms of the parameters. But instead, what I'll do is I'll use the OAuth2 password request form, which also comes with Fast API, and I would just generate uh, a form and basically parameters that allow me to pass in that username and password. And it's going to make it a lot easier when it comes to using the front end, which I'll just show you in a moment. So OAuth2 password request form is what I want. And then in here in the token, what I'll do is the incoming request data, I'll call that form data. And then I'll take uh, the auth2 password request form. I'm going to use the depends, depends class here. And I'll instantiate this with nothing. So basically what this means is that this form data depends on this auth2 password request form. 
So whatever happens here is going to determine whether or not I can continue in this token function. So if this fails for whatever reason, it will never run this token function because it depends on what happens in here. If it does work, it's going to return something and that return value is going to be the form data. So that's all that's happening here. So we don't need to know exactly what's going on here, but just generally it's just a form that uh, we're allowing the users to fill out with a username and password. And then it's going to take that information and pass it to the form data and we'll have it available in the function. So what I'm going to do here for the token, I'm going to return a token and you have to return you know, something that can be used as JSON. So in this case, uh, a dictionary and it needs to be called access token. So when you're using OAuth 2, access token is the name that you need and you need to pass something back. So what I'll do is I'll take the form data dot username. So this will have form data dot username and form data dot password, but I just want the username and I'm going to append token onto the end of it. And we'll see why I'm doing this momentarily. And then the next thing I wanna do is I want to create a regular endpoint. So we can pretend like this endpoint is for our app to actually do something. And I'll define this as the index. And what the index is going to take in is it's going to take in a token. So this token is going to be passed uh, by the, the client, which will either be the fast API docs that I have in my browser, or it can be done uh, through some kind of client that I can call APIs. And I'll show you that in the realistic example, but for this simple example, I'll just use the fast API documentation that's automatically generated. So this is going to be a string, and this is going to depend on the auth2 scheme. So auth2 scheme. So basically what happens here is auth2 scheme is going to be called, it's going to determine whether or not there is a token available. If there is a token, it's going to return it, and then I can use that token for whatever I want inside of the index here. So what I'll do is I'll return that token, and I'll say the token as a value, and then I'll just pass the token. So this is basically the simplest auth2 flow example that I could think of. And now to make it make sense, what I'll do is I'll start up the server. So example app, and then I'll have this reload. And I do need a Python multi-part because auth2 password request form is a type of form. So I can just install this. It's nice that it tells me. So Python multi-part. Then once that's done, I'll start up the server. And I'll go back to the documentation, refresh. And now we see I have uh, this token endpoint, right? So I have the token endpoint. And what I want is I want the uh, this to be git. So I was just writing Flask earlier. So I put route, it should be git. So that's why it didn't appear on the other screen. So now I have two uh, endpoints. I have one token and one for the index. And if you look over here, you see a little lock, which means that this requires authentication. And the reason why this has a lock is because it depends on the OAuth 2 scheme. So if this didn't depend on the OAuth 2 scheme in some way, it wouldn't have that lock. But by having that, it makes it really easy to go through the OAuth 2 flow. So if I go to the index here and then click on the lock, I get a form here and I have a username, a password, a client ID, and a client secret. Uh, you can use these if that's how you want your authentication to work. For my example today, I'm going to use the username and password. So for me, I'll say my username is Anthony and the password is password. And I'll just click authorize. And then you'll see the screen where it says I'm authorized. I can either log out or close. I'm going to close this. And what this means is now that I'm logged in, I can use this index. So I'll hit try it out and then execute. And if we look down here, we see the token is Anthony token. So if you look back at the code, the token is just the username, which I typed in Anthony plus the word token. So it's returning that. And note that I never actually call the token endpoint directly. Instead, I called the index after I logged in. And you see it's a, a lock now, the, the lock is locked now, and that represents that I'm logged in. So I could uh, use the token endpoint directly, but for the docs here, you don't need to, you just need to log in with the lock and it works. So if I log out here and then I try to execute this, I'll get this not authenticated error. 
And that's because it's expecting there to be some kind of access token somewhere. So there is a little bit of magic going on behind the scenes, but I'll show you exactly what's going on uh, with this when I do the more realistic example. But this is basically the flow. So at a minimum, you need an endpoint that generates a token somehow. In the later example, I'll use JSON web token to generate this. And then you can have your regular endpoints that will require authentication to use. Okay, so that is the simple example. So now I wanna create a more realistic example. So we'll do main.py for this. And I'll start by importing from fast API again. So import fast API. I already know I'm going to need depends. And then from fast API dot security, I already know I'm going to need that auth to password bear and the auth to request form. So I'll be using those in this app uh, because I use them in the simple one and this one is going to be more complicated. So let me stop the existing server because I won't be using that one anymore. And I'll go ahead and instantiate fast API. So because this is a more realistic example, I wanna have a database. So I'm going to use tortoise ORM to interact with the database that I created. I'm gonna go ahead and import things from tortoise ORM. So from tor models, I wanna import the model class. And then from tortoise dot, or it shouldn't be dot fields, but just tortoise import fields, just like that. So let me just move this here so it's in a better order. And uh, once I have those two things, I can go ahead and create a model. So this model will be a user model. So class user, it's going to inherit from the model from tortoise.models. And this is going to have uh, just a few fields. So the first field is going to be an integer field. And this is going to be the primary key for uh, this particular user. And then I'll have a username field, which will be a char field. And let's say it's uh, 50 characters long and then unique is true. And then I'll also have a password hash. And that will be a char field as well. Char field. And then let's just say 128. I don't know exactly how long the hash is going to be, but um, I have those uh, three fields. And to help me out a little bit later, what I'll do is I'll create a couple of helper functions or methods inside of here. So the first will be a class method. So we'll have class method and this will be async def uh, get user. And it's going to take in a username, right? So what I want to do is I want to, I want to return uh, the get on the class, right? And then I also want to create a verify password method to uh, verify whether or not the password is correct because I'll be hashing it. So I'll just define this as a verify password self. I'm gonna take in a password. And then for now, I'll just return true, right? Once I have the password hashing working, I'll return the actual result of the verification. So now that I have my user model, uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and register uh, this all on tortoise. So what I need to do is I need to import the register tortoise function from the uh, tortoise RM library. So from tortoise.contrib.fastapi, uh, I'm going to import uh, register tortoise. And then at the bottom of the file, what I can do is I can take this register tortoise and I can use it to get everything running with my database. So I just need to pass in the app. I need a DB URL. So I'm going to use SQLite. So SQLite, I'll call the database db.sqlite3. I need to specify the modules where the models are. So it's going to be in this file. So models are going to be in the main file. So that's just what's going on there. And then generate schema. Generate schema equals true. So generate schema true just means that if the database doesn't exist or the models or schemas don't exist within that database, then it will generate them for me. So it will create the table for me. And then I can do add exception handlers as well to true, just so um, if there is an error, everything will work. And this should go outside of the user class. So let me just de-indent everything. Okay, so now when I run this, I'm expecting to see a database. So let me go ahead and start up Hypercorn main app, and then I don't need to reload. 
uh, no module named tortoise, of course. So I just need to install it. So pip install tortoise orm. And it failed because there should be a dash in between. So tor this orm. Okay, so it looks like it worked this time. So now I can go ahead and start up a server. And let's see, generate schema. I believe that's plural. So I'll just add an S on there. And this should be plural as well, add exception handlers. Okay, so it looks like it worked. And we see here I have the SQLite files on the left-hand side. And I'll just stop the server. And I'll just open up the SQLite database in type.schema. And we see I have the user schema here, the user table ID, username, and password hash. The next thing I want to do is I want to create pydantic models from this user model. So the user model will represent what's in the database and then the pydantic models will represent what's going on in the app when I'm using the users. So I'll go ahead and import from tortoise.contrib dot pydantic, I'm going to import uh, the pydantic model creator. And that will allow me to create models uh, based off of my tortoise ORM model. So I'll create a couple and I'll just put them underneath the user model here. So the first one I'll call user pydantic. And the second one I'll call user in pydantic. So these will be pretty similar. The idea is one will represent everything that the user has, and the second will just represent uh, things that the user can actually pass in as input. And we'll see how this works. You don't necessarily need it like this, but this is the example that Tortoise ORM uses. So I'll pass in the user model and I'll give it a name, so user. And then likewise, I'll do the same thing for the other one. And this will also be the user model, but I can't have the same name, so I'll call this user in. And then here you would normally exclude uh, read only equals true. You don't necessarily need it in my example, but just as a way of showing you the difference between the two. So the idea is if there is some read only data, you wouldn't expect the user to pass it in because it's read only. So that's why this has exclude read only. But in this particular example, it's not really necessary. So now what I wanna do is I want to create an endpoint that allows me to create new users. And this is really just an example. It doesn't really make sense to uh, have an unauthenticated endpoint to create users as easily, but we do need a way to get users in the database. So I'll, I'll create this. So what I'll do is I'll create an endpoint called uh, slash users, and it's gonna be post, and it's going to return. So response underscore model. It's gonna return a user pydantic, right? because that's what my user is. And I'm going to create the user function. So I'll create user function. And then it's going to take in the user in, right? So this user in here, this user is going to be input. And then this user pydantic is going to be output. So using this, uh, what I can do is I can create a user. So I'll just say user object. Uh, equals user, and then uh, username is going to be uh, user dot username. And then the password hash is going to be some kind of password passed in, and it's gonna be hash for me, right? So before I can hash the password, of course, I need to have some kind of library available to hash it. So what I'll do is I'll use passlib. So pip install passlib. And this will allow me to hash passwords. And if I just import from passlib, so we'll put it up here, we'll say from passlib.hash import bcrypt. So I'll use bcrypt to hash this and really the simplest way with bcrypt. And then I'll go back down to the uh, user object where I create it. And to generate the hash, what I'll do is I'll use that bcrypt that I just imported. I'll call hash on it and then user dot password hash. So what's going to happen is the uh, user is going to pass in a username and a password hash. The hash or pass won't actually be hashed when the user passes it. But once it gets here, it will be hashed uh, by bcrypt, right? So once I do that, I can await uh, user object dot save. Remember, tortoise is an async library. So I have to await anything that may take time. So to save, I have to await. So 
Then I can also await converting uh, the user object, which is a tortoise or M model, to the user Pydantic. So I can take the user Pydantic and I can say from tortoise uh, ORM, and I can pass in that user object. So what happens here is it's going to take a user object. So this is a tortoise or M object, and it's going to convert it to the user Pydantic object, uh, which is the response type, and the user will get that in return. So basically, I'm just creating the user and then passing back the information about that user. So I'll see the ID, the username, and the actual hash password. So let's go ahead and start this up and let's see if I can create a user. So I'll go back over here and refresh because I am now in a completely different app. And we see I have posts, uh, users, create user, and it takes in a username and password. So I'll go ahead and try this out. And for the username, it will just be Anthony. And for the password, it will be password. Uh, let's not use password because I want it to be something completely different. So I'll just say my secret as a password. So I'll hit execute here and I get an error. So let's just see what this error is. Um, bcrypt, no backends available. So I need to install bcrypt before using it with passlib. It's not a dependency. So let me go ahead and do that. And now let me start up the server again and try this. So the data is going to be the same, Anthony and my secret. I'll try executing again. And I just did, and we see that I have ID one, Anthony, and then I have this hashed value. So we're not saving my secret in the database because it's being hashed. And let me go ahead and create a second user. Second user will be pretty printed, and we'll say the password for this is my other secret. So I'll execute this, and then I have ID2, pretty printed, and then another hashed value. Right, so let's go over to the database and take a look at that. I'm stopping Hypercorn, and I'll just open up the database, and I'll select star from my user table. And we see in the database, I have IDs one and two, Anthony and pretty printed, and then I have the hashed password. So know where the plain text password is getting saved, just the hashed one. And now that I do have a hashed value in the database, I can uh, work on this verify password method here. And that's pretty simple to use. So it's going to be bcrypt.verify. And I just need to pass in for the first argument, the password that the user is trying. And then for the second argument, it needs to be the password hash. So it's going to be self.password hash because I'm, I'm going to be calling this on a user object. So we'll see that momentarily when I set up the authentication, but I'm just creating this now because you know I have the hashing, so now I can verify the hashing. So now that we have that, let's start adding in the authentication stuff, the, the, the flow, the auth to flow. So first thing I need to do is I need to create that auth to scheme. And what I'll do is I'll just put it here. So auth to scheme. It's going to take that uh, bear again. And then the token URL will just be token. So that's exactly like the simple example that we had before. And now we need to create the token endpoint. So what I'll do is I'll put it above the users. So remember that the token endpoint needs to be post. So slash token. And I'll call this uh, generate token, generate token. And if you recall from the previous example, I have form data, so form data, and then I'll take in the auth to password request form, and it's going to depend on that. Next thing I want to do is I want to verify that the uh, form data is correct. So remember the form data is going to be a username and password. So to authenticate, basically what I have to do is I have to query the database, both see if that user exists, and I need to see if the password is correct. So the easiest way to do this, I think, is to create another function, and this function will return either a user object or false in the case that the authentication didn't work. So I'll just put this right above, and I'll call this uh, authenticate user, authenticate user. It's gonna take in a username, which is a string, and a password as well which is also a string. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get the user object. So I can say uh, user equals await, and then I can say user get uh, username, username. And just looking at this, um, I really don't need to get user like that, but 
I'm just getting the user. So username, user dot get uh, username equals username. So now, if this user exists, it will return the user, and if it doesn't exist, then it will be null. So if I say if not user, that means that this will only execute if nothing was found. So I'll just return false. So that means that there is no user in the database that has that username. And then I can also add another if statement saying that if user dot verify password and then return false, right? So verify password will return true if the password is correct. It will return false if it isn't correct. So this will only execute if it's false and I'll return false in that case. And then if both of those pass, I'll just return the user. So now I can go back into the generate token and I can say user is going to equal await uh, authenticate user. And I'm just gonna pass in the username and the password. So form data dot username and the form data dot password. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, return something if the authentication fails. So for now, I can just say, if not user, let's say return uh, error uh, invalid credentials. And I'll change this to be like a, a better error in a moment, but I'll just use that for now. And if it gets past this point, that means that the user both exists and the user has been authenticated because the password matches. So what I'll do here is I'll say user object is going to equal uh, await. So I need to call await because I'm going to use user pydanic dot from tortoise or m again, taking that user, right? So I'm just converting this tortoise or m user to the user pydantic uh, object. And now what I want to do is I want to create a token. Right, so now I know at this point I'm authenticated and I have the user object available to use. So what I'll do is I'll install PyJWT and then I need to import that. So here at the top, uh, I'll import it. So from JWT, I think I just wanna import. So import JWT and then I'll go back down here in my token, I'll go ahead and create the token. So at a minimum, I need See, so JWT encode, this is the uh, method I'm calling or the function on uh, JWT, so encode. And then I'm going to convert my user object to a dictionary, right? Because this is going to be the payload for the JSON web token. And then I need a secret. So I'll just say uh, JWT secret, anything. I'll make this a constant at the top. Uh, my JWT secret, you obviously want something that's more of a secret than that, but just for example purposes, I'll use that. And this will return a token. And next, what I want to do is I want to return that. So remember that I need to return access token, token. And just to make this a more standard, you can also return the token type. So token type is going to be bear. So I should now be able to get a token in return uh, when I pass in the username and password. So let's see if I can try that. So I'll start up the server. And then I'll go here, refresh, and then I'll go to generate token. Uh, let's try it out. So Anthony is the username and my secret is the password. I'll execute this. And as a result, I get this access token. So what I'll do is I'll go to chat IO and I'm going to take this access token. Let me see if I can copy the whole thing here and we'll just put it in the debugger here so we can see what's going on. So I'll paste that in there. And if you look here, what happens is you see uh, my ID. So one, we see the username is Anthony and we see the password hash is this. So normally you wouldn't have the password hash in here, but you know, just to keep it simple for my purposes, I'm including everything uh, because I'm passing, let me go back to my code, I'm passing uh, the user object as a dictionary and inside the user object, I have the password. You don't have to do it that way, but there's not exactly uh, any harm in this simple example, although really you wouldn't want your password hashes to be included in the payload. So whatever you want in the payload, you can include here. But for example purposes, I'm including this, but it's really up to you to decide what needs to go in the payload. So I have that here. 
and I know I can get the token and let me just show you what happens when I don't pass in the right information. So I'll just take away the T in secret, execute and I get invalid credentials because uh, that's what I'm returning here if it doesn't work. So the last thing I need to do is I need to do the reverse of this. I need to take a token in and determine what's in that token and basically allow that to control uh, whether or not the user can uh, be authenticated as that user. So uh, what I'll do first is I'll create an endpoint. And I'll call this app get slash user slash me. So basically what's gonna happen is when the user goes here and they're logged in, they're authenticated, they're passing a token, it's just gonna return their user object. So here the response model is going to be the user Pydanic model. And then I'll create the function and we'll call this get user. And yeah, just thinking about it now, I'm not going to use um, this particular get user. So I don't really need it. You just delete that. And get user, I'll pass in user and then user Pydanic. And actually, I'll, yeah, I'll use user Pydanic because I'll show you what's happening with this in a moment. So instead of user in, I'll use user Pydanic. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it's going to depend on uh, a function called get current user. So I'm going to define this get current user in a moment, but just know that because it depends on it, this is going to run first and it should return a user object in the end. So all I wanna do here is just return that back, return user, so we'll see that uh, when I run the example. So the last thing I need to do for this is create the get current user function. So I'll create that here. So async def get current user, uh, get, get user current. No, I won't get current user, I wrote that backwards. So get current user will be the name that I want. And it's going to take in a token and this is going to depend on that OAuth2 scheme. So what happens is, as long as there's the OAuth2 scheme somewhere in the dependency chain, I'll get that lock on my route here. So I have get current user, so it depends on get current user, but get current user depends on OAuth2 scheme, and because it depends on OAuth2 scheme, it's going to return that lock. So now inside of here, in my uh, get current user function, uh, what I want to do is I want to decode the token. So remember, this is passed automatically in a sense. So what I'll say is payload is going to be equal to jwt.decode. And I pass in the token, which is a parameter. And then I need to pass in the secret. So jwt secret. I need to pass in the algorithms that it needs to try. So algorithms. And I believe this is hs256. That's the default one. So that's what I'll use and then I can get the uh, user for the particular ID so I'll say user equals await um, and then user dot get and this time I want to get using the ID and then the ID should be in the payload because the payload is just everything that is here in purple so ID equals payload dot get and there's an ID in there and then if this doesn't work uh, I want to return an error. And you know, this is a good time to import uh, HTTP exception and also I believe status. So what I'll do is I'll raise that HTTP exception if this fails for whatever reason. So I'll say raise HTTP exception, status code is going to be status.http 401 unauthorized and that's all caps. And the detail will be invalid username or password. Let me just put this on two lines. Yeah, so that will just make it a little bit better as an error message. And what I'll do is I'll raise this uh, here as well instead of just returning error. Okay, so raise the exception if this doesn't work, but if it does work, then I'll have this uh, user object available. And then what I want to do is I want to convert this to the user Pydantic because remember, I'm expecting a user Pydantic object here. So user Pydantic dot from tortoise ORM and user. And the reason why I'm using this one instead of user in is because the user isn't passing this directly. The token is being passed. So 
I believe this is it for the example. So let me go ahead and restart the server and hopefully everything works. But of course that almost never happens the first time. So let's try it out. Let's go to the docs again. And we see the lock here on users.me. So I'll hit the lock and I'll put in my username and password. So Anthony and my secret is the password. I'll hit authorize. Then we see it says authorize. I'll try it out, execute. And in the results, we see that it did work the first time. I see ID one, Anthony and password hash. So this is the object. And if I were to log out of this, try it again, I get not authenticated. So that's the error message that's being raised. And if I log in with my other user, pretty printed, and then my other secret is the password for this one. I'll hit authorize, close, execute, and then we see a pretty printed and then the password hash for that along with ID number two. So of course, in a real app, what you would do is in here, you would just do whatever is necessary for your app, and then you'll have the user object available for the currently logged in user, and then you can do anything you want with it. But note that you don't have to uh, get the user object yourself in this route. You only need to define it once, and then you can create as many routes as you want, as many endpoints as you want, and they can all depend on get current user, and then you'll get the user object in return, and then you can use that in each individual endpoint. So I told you before, I'll show you a different way of doing this because the documentation is a bit magic. So what I'll do is I'll start up Postman. Okay, so we're in Postman now. So what I need to do is I need to add in my URL, so port 8000. And the first thing I need to do is I need to uh, log in. So I need to request a token, right? So I'm doing uh, my URL slash token. And then in the body, what I'll do is remove this from a different API. Uh, form data here, the key is going to be username, and the value is going to be Anthony, and then the other key will be password, and the value will be my secret. So if I send these two values, the username and password, and a get, or excuse me, a post request, if I send that, I get an access token in return. And just to show you that this is actually authenticating, if I take off the T in secret and hit send, I get invalid username or password. So that's exactly what I want to see. So I just sent the request and this is the token that I get. So I'll just copy the token and then I'll create a request to the uh, users.me or user slash me. So 127001 users me. So first I'll send this and I get not authenticated. So to authenticate myself, I'll go to authorization here and then they have OAuth 2.0, that's what I'm using. Uh, we have bearer token and I can just pass in my token somewhere. So access token, I just put it in here. Postman makes it pretty easy to handle these things. So now this token will be sent along with the request. So if I send, now I get the information for Anthony here at the bottom just like we saw in the documentation, but now I have to actually request the token directly and then take that token and put in, in all the requests that require it. So now if I go back and log in as pretty printed, we'll see I'll get a different token. So my other secret, I'll hit send. I'll take that other token, copy it in here and then send, and then we get the information for pretty printed. And if I just mess up this token a little bit, so it's invalid and hit send, then I get invalid username or password again. Or this can just be like invalid authentication, whatever, but we get a 401, which means that the authentication isn't working correctly. So that's all that I want to show you for this example. Uh, I believe that should be enough to get you started with basic authentication uh, in Fast API. And from there, you just continue creating your endpoints and uh, you use like get current user. And like I said, you might want to think of a different thing you want to put in the payload. I don't think it's the best idea to put the password hash. Uh, so, you know, think of your payload. Maybe it can just be the user object with everything but the password hash. Maybe it can just be the ID. It can be whatever you want here, but you're just passing some kind of payload uh, for the token. So you can get that out when you decode it here.
So if you have any questions about this, feel free to leave a comment down below. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. So thank you for watching and I will talk to you next time.